We're going to close our sermon series today on five lethal assumptions. And in our culture today, let's see if you agree with this statement. The standard definition of love is that you never do or say anything that might be upsetting or offensive to another person. Does that sound about right for the culture that we're living in today? You never can do or say anything if you love someone that might be upsetting or offensive to that person. You, you never do or say anything that might get in the way of them expressing their own personal desires, however they choose. To love someone is to affirm and approve whatever it is that they believe about themselves or choose to do with their bodies or their money or their lives. In our world today, it's virtually impossible to say, you know what, you're on the wrong path. You're wrong, but you're loved. It's almost impossible to say that. To tell someone they are wrong, that they are misguided, that they're in danger, that they're in the process of destroying their lives, both for now and for eternity, is considered hate speech. It's bigotry. It's intolerance. It's it's a pho- you you have a phobia. Let's see if if this sums it up. I, I read this not long ago, and probably some of you have seen this floating around on social media. I want to do X, whatever, whatever that thing is. I want to do that thing, X. Okay? You, you are free to do it. But, but you think X is wrong, right? Yes. Yes, I do. Well, that's because you want to control me. Well, no, you, you're actually free to do what you want. But you think X is wrong. Y- yes, I do. But only because I love you and I want your ultimate good. But I want to do X. I want to do this thing. You you have freedom to do that. But I want you to say that X is good. Well, I, I I can't say that. Why do you hate me? Right? Why do you hate me? Why do you hate me so much? Today's fifth and final lethal assumption is to love someone is to give them unconditional approval and affirmation. There's our assumption that we're working off of. To love someone is to give them unconditional approval and affirmation. So following that logic, it is unloving to challenge, confront, or correct. If you do any of those things, (laughs) you're going to become my enemy really fast. It means you hate me. If you, if you just disagree with me, it means you hate me. You're being intolerant. Loving someone means always accepting and embracing whatever they choose to think or feel or do. People should be able to decide for themselves what's right and what's wrong. Let's, let's examine this assumption as we're getting started this morning, where does this, where does this thinking come from? Why do, why do we think so many have fallen victim to this mode of thinking, this way of thinking? Uh, and really, even it's, it's starting to creep into the church. Why have so many fallen for this way of thinking? The bottom line, here's the bottom line. One can appear to be thoughtful, non-judgmental, and neutral by saying that right and wrong are things that people should decide for themselves, right? If, if I take that stance, well, everyone should just be able to choose for themselves, then I want to give the appearance of being, wow, look how thoughtful I am and how loving and tolerant and non-judgmental I am. Everyone should just be free to choose for themselves. Makes me sound morally superior, doesn't it? Well, only mean-spirited people would, could possibly oppose freedom and love and letting people just follow their heart. You're being closed-minded and intolerant. You know, there are no absolutes. There are no absolutes. But my question to that would be, well, isn't that an absolute statement? 
right? There are no absolutes. That, that's an absolute statement. So, so you're using an absolute statement to actually deny an absolute. Well, all truth is, is relative. Well, is that statement a relative truth? That, that's an absolute statement. All truth is relative. That's an absolute statement. Well, no one has the whole truth. Well, is that statement the whole truth? Think, think, follow, follow the logic with me. N- no one has the whole truth. Well, is that statement the whole truth? Well, that's true for you, but not for me. Is, is, is that statement only true for you or for everybody? Well, the right thing to do is to let people decide what they, want, what they think is right, whatever their truth is. But here's what I need us to see today. Your own idea of right becomes the standard for deciding this. And then you expect everyone else to follow your absolute standard. Right? Well, no, there are no... Well, wait a minute. You do. You are actually establishing what you think is right. That becomes your absolute standard that you want everyone else to comply to. Well, what is that standard? Well, it's myself, my heart, what I feel is right, whatever is true for me. Internal, subjective preferences. Pay, pay close attention to all three of those words. Internal, subjective, preferences. Can we see what's happening? Moral relativists object to God's standard. I, 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 don't, I don't want God's standard, but then I'm going to play God by using my own standards and expect everyone to comply. You see where, the, where this falls apart? But so many of us are, are kind of tiptoeing and, and wanting to buy into this, this assumption, this lie that's floating around in our culture today. Well, if you don't comply to my standards, then you hate me. You must hate me. You're, you have a phobia. You're being intolerant. That's, that's not true. All I'm doing is disagreeing with you. But here's the thing. You know what these labels are meant to do? They're meant to shut down the discussion. If I can put this label on you, guess what? All of a sudden, well, I don't want to be labeled that. Then then people aren't going to like me. What? So these labels are meant to be discussion enders, to shut down the discussion, to pressure wholesale acceptance of my view, regardless of its validity. I want you to drop your argument for fear of making you look bad. I don't don't want to look bad, so I'm just going to drop it. You're just trying to force your beliefs on other people, right? That's another argument. Well, think about this. Even moral relativists are choosing their worldview to the exclusion of others, all right? I've I've looked at all of the others, and I'm choosing this worldview to the exclusion of others, Because they judge it to be better and believe it is the way. They're sure they're right. So the question becomes, if everyone is relying on absolutes, even though we might not want to admit it or not, if everyone relies on absolutes, if there are absolute standards that we should be following, if there is a right way, then what is it? And see, this is not a new question. We think we're so advanced in our thinking but even Pilate 2,000 years ago when he's talking to Jesus, he asked the same question. You know, what, I mean, what is truth? Can anybody really know truth? What is truth? So this is not a new question at all. The question, the real question is, who gets to decide what is right? What is the standard of truth? There's the question. Who gets to decide? Is it us? Th- think about this. Wrestle with this. Do you want you to be the one who decides the standard, the absolute standard that we should be living up to? Us as limited, finite human beings. We don't know all things about all subjects, do we? We don't know everything. That's why we learn. We learn because we find out new stuff that we didn't know yesterday. How many times have you said in your life, oh, I didn't know that, or 
man, I just, I don't understand that. I don't get that. Is, is that the standard that we want? Is, is that what we want to follow with our lives? Whatever my mind can grab, whatever makes sense to me, whatever feels right at the time, do you see what kind of chaos that's going to create? My own idea of right, my absolute standard that everyone else should buy into. Or how about this? Can, can I offer an alternative to, to this? Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 18, verse 37. He says, I came to bring truth to the world. This is why I came. And, and I, I want to enter into all the confusion and to help answer that question, what is truth? I came to bring it to you, to show it to you. He says in John 8, 32, and you will know the truth. You will know the truth. According to Jesus, Jesus is some, uh, tr uh, truth is something that exists. There is a thing called truth. It's not a made-up concept. He says, I came to bring it to help you understand it. It can be learned and discovered. And here's the kicker. It sits outside of us. It's outside of you. It's an objective standard that transcends us as human beings, our emotions, our thoughts, it's outside of us. Jesus actually says in John 14, 6, I am the truth. Let, let me get even more pointed. The truth is a person, and I am the truth, Jesus says. He says, I am the source of truth, of perfect truth. Everything else is just guesswork. There's only one infinite, perfect, limitless source of truth, and it's God, our creator, Revealed through his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to John 1.14. The word, the word who was with God in the beginning, who was with God and was God, what happens? He became flesh. Jesus takes on human flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. And what is Jesus full of? Grace and truth. Have you ever seen a glass of water that's just full to the brim? What happens if you just, if you just barely touch that glass of water? It, it spills out. It overflows. This is what Jesus is full of when he comes to the earth. The word becomes flesh, and he's absolutely full of grace and truth. And he wants to reveal that to us. I love how Tony Evans said it. See, when you know everything about everything, you can't be wrong, right? That's who God is. We, we just learned about who God is in our previous series. When you know everything about everything, you can't be wrong. When you know past, present, and future, you can't be wrong. When you done made it all, sustained it all, and one day will destroy it all, you can't be wrong. Truth is the absolute standard by which reality should be measured. He goes on to say, give, give us a brief definition. It's God's view on any subject matter. God's view on, if we want to know what the truth is, it's God's view on any subject matter. And this truth lives outside of you, outside of space and time, outside of your five senses. It comes from a different source, from another realm. In other words, if it's true, then it doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. It doesn't matter whether you feel it or not. If it's truth, it is true because God says it is. This means that there's no such thing as my truth and your truth. You may have your opinion, your feelings, your perspective, but when it comes to what is true, that has already been decided by God himself. So here's, here's kind of... A Tony Evans' last line, our greatest challenge then is to adjust ourselves to God's point of view on every subject. So I'm asking us today, is, is that what we're willing to do? If, if this is the truth, are we willing to adjust our lives, ourselves, to God's point of view on every subject? See, we got to slow down. 
and we've got to think through what we're doing with our lives. Are we buying into what the culture is telling us? Or are we living our lives based on God's truth? What has God said on this matter? If you ask that on the front end, you're going to save yourselves a lot of heartache and headaches on the back end. What has God said on this matter? So the question that you're going to have to answer, I'm going to have to answer, we're going to have to talk to your friends about answering is this. What will be your standard, the standard of your determining the truth? Will it be your feelings that are always changing? Will it be your intellect that you, you feel like you're so smart, but our little brains are so finite? Will it be your personal moral code that's different from person to person to person to person? What's going to be your standard? So back to our lethal assumption. Does love mean unconditional affirmation and approval, really the only purpose I have for you is to affirm me in my life. That's all I need from you. Just affirm me. Or does love mean understanding God's point of view, right? That's the truth. And then speaking and acting with the best interests of others in mind. That's actually grace. What was Jesus full of? Grace and truth. Understanding God's point of view, and then I'm going to act and speak and love with your best interests in mind. Whatever that looks like. That's actually the biblical definition of love, of agape love. It's not a feeling, it's an action. It's a commitment to do things that benefit the one who is loved. So that's my concern for you. When I love you, I I want what's best for you. I want God's best for you, actually. So I'm going to seek God's truth in the person of Jesus, and I want to help you become like him. That's, that's, That's the best I can give you in this life. Let me share an illustration I read this week. Imagine picking up your car from the shop. You take it in for a routine tune up. The technician says, oh, this car is in great shape, no issues, no problems. Keep doing what you're doing. Then later that day, you go to put your foot on the brakes, and they don't work. They're they're not working. And you find out later that you were completely out of brake fluid, that you could have been in a devastating accident. You, You could have died because your brakes didn't work. You go back to the shop, and you say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me this issue that I had? And the technician replies, well, you know, I didn't want you to feel bad. <laughs> Plus, to be honest, I, I was afraid you might get upset with me. And I want this to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. You'd be furious, right? I mean, this guy put your life on the line by not telling you the truth. You, you could have died. You'd say, I didn't come here for you to sugarcoat what's really going on. I mean, I need you to tell me what's happening with my vehicle. I need you to fix it. That's what I need from you. I want the truth. My life depends on it. Imagine going to the doctor's office for a checkup, and the doctor says to you, wow, you are just a magnificent physical specimen. You know, you've got the body of an, an athlete. You know, the Olympics are coming up this summer. I bet you could compete. Woo, I mean, I'm, you, you've got it. You are to be congratulated. Now, later that day, you're trying to climb some stairs, or maybe you're trying to shovel some mulch out in our parking lot yesterday, and your heart gives out. Mine, mine was close, too. But you find out later your arteries were so clogged that you were like one jelly donut away from the Grim Reaper. You go back to the doctor and you say, Doc, why why didn't you tell me? Why in the world did you not tell me? The doctor says, well, I knew your body was in worse shape than the Pillsbury Doughboy, but if I tell people stuff like that, they kind of get offended, right? I mean, it's kind of bad for business. They, They don't come back. I want this to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. Again, you'd be furious, right? 
You'd be furious. You'd say to the doctor, when it comes to my health, my life depends on it. I need the truth. I want the truth. I need you to help me. Obviously, when something matters to us, we don't want fake flattery, do we? We don't want lies in order to avoid maybe temporary discomfort in our lives, what the truth might bring. We want the truth, maybe. Maybe for everybody else, but a lot of times we don't want it when it comes to us, do we? When it comes to me, I'm not sure I want the truth. Winston Churchill wrote, men occasionally stumble on the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. Ah, We might stumble on the truth, but I'm not sure I want the truth for my life. So the question for us becomes, how much do we really want God's point of view? That's the truth. That's, That's our working definition of truth today. How much do we really want God's point of view on matters that we're facing in our life? How much does your soul matter to you, right? Oh my gosh, our car, we just, we just admitted our car matters so much to us. Our body matters so much. How about our soul? How much does your soul matter to you? Are you willing to hear the truth about what our soul needs? One more scenario. Imagine going to a church where you hear, you know, don't worry about it if you, if you mismanage your anger. Nobody here is going to confront you on that because we don't really like conflict. Right? What, we, when we have our new member meeting, and that's, that's what Ray leads with. All right? D- don't worry if you hoard lots of money. Lots of us have lots of money, but we'll never ask you to give because some people might get mad and leave. So we, we never talk about that here. Or, you know, don't worry if you're caught up in sexual sin. We, we might talk occasionally about sin, but really we, we make it about sin out there in the world. About out there, but nobody here is going to talk to you about sin because then you wouldn't feel good, would you? The goal is to walk out of church feeling good. Is that what we want? Is that what we want? A, a, a young man asked me about a month ago. He said, Don, is there ever going to be a Sunday when you stand up to preach and you just tell a bunch of jokes and I leave feeling good afterwards? <laughs> and I said, oh, man, may, maybe someday, but probably not anytime soon. Because it's not about trying to make us feel good. It's about what we need to hear. But not coming at you with a hammer, right? I'm not going to hammer you with the truth. That's not who Jesus is. We need grace and truth together. Proverbs 28, 23 says, In the end, people appreciate honest criticism far more than flattery. Or do we? That's the question. Or or do we? Of course, transformation involves grace. We love grace. We love to hear about grace. We love to get books and and messages about grace. But the danger is we can misunderstand grace and start to worship feeling good instead of actually worshiping Jesus. That's the danger. And we're always going to the extremes, aren't we? We're either on the extreme side of truth or on the extreme side of grace. And the Bible says Jesus was the perfect combination of both. That's why people were drawn to him. That's why he could say hard truths and people still knew that he cared about them. And he loved them. And he understood what they were going through and felt for them and their struggles. But at the same time, I'm not going to leave you here where you are. Jesus was full of grace and truth. I saw a social media post a couple years ago. I took a screenshot of it because it just... I was flabbergasted that that somebody posted this, but it got likes and it got hearts and it got amen. Oh, that's who Jesus is. Let me share what this post said. It said, Jesus is right in the middle of the party. He's on the dance floor with his robes hitched up to his knees. And at one point, someone touches the hem of his robe and begs to be healed. 
to be anything other than this. And Jesus reaches out his arms, cups this person's face, and says, My beautiful child, there is nothing in this heart of yours that ever needs to be healed. What? Is, is, that, is that who Jesus was? Is, do we see that in his life? And in his ministry, uh, in Mark 7, 21 through 23, he says, out of the heart, what what comes out of our hearts? Sexual immorality and and evil thoughts and adultery and greed and lust and envy and slander and pride. That's what I came to deal with. That's why I came to earth, to, to, to help us get new hearts. Our hearts have to be dealt with. But, oh, doesn't it sound morally superior? Doesn't it sound so good to say, oh, Jesus just loved everybody, and he looks at this person who's begging to be healed. Oh, there's, there's nothing in that beautiful heart of yours that ever needs to change, needs to be dealt with. Is that love? Is that our defin- That's our working definition of love for so many of us. You should affirm me. You should approve me no matter what choices I'm making, no matter what I'm doing with my life. That's not love. That's not love. Here's what we see in the life and ministry of Jesus. We see perfect grace and truth. Remember the woman caught in adultery? She was guilty. She deserved the truth. She she deserved condemnation. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you. But does he stop there? No, he doesn't. He says, go and sin no more. Go and leave that life of sin. It's leading you nowhere. He does not stoop down in the sand and cup her face and say, just keep doing what you're doing. You don't need to change anything. That would be the most unloving thing Jesus could ever do for that woman. He says, You're not going to find what you're looking for the way that you're looking for it. Leave that life of sin. Jesus doesn't give her a free pass. What about another man that he encountered in John 5, 14? Jesus says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. I healed you. I brought you restoration. Don't go back to that old life. Don't go back to that old sin. Or that stuff's going to come flooding right back into your life again. How about the woman at the well? My goodness, what a, what a gracious conversation he's having with this outcast, this woman. He's full of grace. But guess what he says right in the middle of the conversation? Verse 16. He says, hey, we're having such a good conversation. Why don't you go and get your husband? And she said, I don't have a husband. That's, that's a partial truth. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, this woman was living in sin. She needed forgiveness. And Jesus exposed her need by confronting her sin. His words actually go to the core of her problem. She's seeking what Ray talked about last week. You remember those three ways he said, those needs that we have in our life? She is seeking significance and meaning and affirmation in these relationships instead of in God. And Jesus says, here's what I need you to see. You're not going to find it there. I'm the one who can give you that. Well, you know, we worship here and the Jews worship here. No, 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 it's not about where. I am that person. I am the living water. I'm here to bring you truth and love and forgiveness, give you new life. Here's what I want us to see. This was the most loving thing he could have done for this woman at the well. He knows the truth. And he offers her what he's truly, what she is truly searching for, living water. He doesn't condone the sin. We never see Jesus condoning the sin. But he also doesn't condemn the sinner. That's truth and grace together. Truth and grace. 
He's the only one who can rightly condemn, and yet he offers overwhelming, astonishing grace to all of us. Think of how he dealt with the sin of his disciples, the anger of James and John, the fear of Peter, the doubt of Thomas, the pride of all 12 as they debated who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. He uses it as a teaching moment. He gets up from the table, takes off his robe, puts a towel around his waist, and he washes their feet. And he says, I need y'all to follow my example. I need you to do to others as I have done to you. See, he's confronting, he's instructing, and he's restoring with truth and grace. Here's what was amazing about Jesus. He came to reach broken people, not people who claim to have it all together. Listen to what Matthew 9, 12 says. Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick, sick people do. This is who I came to love and minister to. Jesus loved people struggling with spiritual and emotional and physical ailments, but his love always had a fierce, redemptive agenda. Always. Every encounter Jesus had with people was a divine setup to bring them into relationship with him and prepare them for restoration. I've got new life for you. And if he had any other agenda, he wouldn't be loving Jesus knew that sin was destructive in our lives. It needed to be overcome. It's what he came to die for. He paid the price for our sins. Think about it. To love someone and to let them remain in their hurt and brokenness and dysfunction, that would be cruel, wouldn't it? That would be cruel. What kind of God would merely pity the brokenness of the human heart but not do something about it? But he did. He did come to do something about it. He saw people as precious and valuable and in need of healing. And he wanted to enter their brokenness and offer them a way out. And how did he do it? He didn't run around screaming at people and calling them sinners. He didn't protest with signs on the street and call them bad names. He simply stooped down to where they were and laid the options out on the table. Do you want life? Do you want life? Do you want to be free You can be free if you follow me. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But you got to follow me. you got to trust me that I'm the answer. The answer isn't in religion. It's not in a bottle. It's not in another person's bed. It's following me. So are you willing to follow me? Do you believe that I am the answer? I am the way. I am the truth and the life. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices with the truth. Have you ever tried to stop someone you love from doing something really stupid? Yeah. How'd that go? Did they, did they rejoice with the truth? <laughs> yeah, probably not. Probably not. It may have been a a foolish choice, a dumb business move. It might have been a relationship that was obviously bad for the person. Perhaps you saw a friend starting to be unfaithful in marriage, or that person wanted a divorce for a trivial reason, or you could see them slipping into alcohol or drug abuse, or you realized that their anger was out of control. Whatever it was, you saw it. You tried to step in and help them to see the light. You wanted to save them from making a terrible mistake. You could see it, but they couldn't. I'm telling you today, that's why we need each other. That's why we need each other. That's why God put us together in these relationships, in this place, in this family. All of us have blind spots in our lives. Other times, I'm doing all I can to avoid the truth. You ever been there yourself? Man, I'm trying to dodge the truth every way I possibly can. I'm justifying what I'm doing. I'm rationalizing what I'm doing. I'm employing strategic memory loss when it comes to the Word of God. Right? I'm avoiding people. I'm avoiding relationships. I'm avoiding a service like this because anything to avoid the truth. Let's think about that person. Maybe you tried to stop from doing something that would ruin their life. The conversation probably went something like this. You tried to share the truth. What was the response? Get out of my life. Stop, 
Stop trying to rain on my parade. I'm not hearing what you have to say. I'm, I'm, only, trying to, I'm only trying to help you. If you want to help me, you can leave me alone. Or better yet, you can just affirm, approve what I'm, what I'm doing, what I want to do. Right? That's what love is. That's, that's what love is. Unconditional approval and affirmation. Tell me what I want to hear. But, but I'm your friend, and I love you. And I'm trying to help you see what this could lead to. Well, you're no friend if you act like that. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, how can we not see that when, when we're in the situation? We've been on both sides of this argument, haven't we? Probably in our lives. How do you help someone who doesn't think they need to be helped? How do, you, how do we share the truth in love? If we need each other, and this is, if, if Jesus was full of grace and truth, then as his followers, guess what? If his spirit of truth is in us, guess what we're going to be full of as well? We should, as we're growing to become like Christ, full of grace and truth. So how can we share that with other people? Let me, let me share just a few things as we're closing today. Here's, here's the first thing we can do. A gentle approach is always best. If you're going to share truth in love, full of grace, a gentle approach is always best. That, uh, uh, something stuck out in, in a marriage thing that Meredith and I did several years ago, a phrase, and I still remember it says, you can be right but wrong at the top of your voice. Right? Right? Depends on how you're delivering the truth. You deliver the truth to me at the top of your voice. Am I just, oh, thank you for that. Oh, no, I am, I am going on the defensive. I'm putting on the, on the gloves, and I'm like, let's go. I'm ready to go. You can be right but wrong at the top of your voice. Listen to what Proverbs 15.1 says. A gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word, what is it? We just said it. It stirs up anger. Isn't that, that's just true. That, but we still think, oh, you know, I still haven't learned my lesson. I'm still going to yell and scream, and I'm going to get out my truth hammer, and I'm going to hammer you with the truth. Are we ever going to learn that that doesn't work? That's, that, it doesn't. We, we, we just keep repeating the same mistakes. Being gentle may not make sense, but that's God. That's who Jesus was. This is who Jesus was. Number two, showing grace doesn't mean being soft on sin. See, we, we're afraid of grace because all of a sudden, because we go to the extremes, don't we? Well, if, if I show grace, that means I don't care about sin. You remember Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Shall we go on sinning so that the grace of God may abound? And he's like, What? What? Of course not. No. No. We have, we have died to sin. We don't go on sinning so that grace may abound. Showing grace does not mean being soft on sin. He had to remind the Romans, hey, we've died. We've died to sin. Gentleness doesn't mean winking, winking at sin or looking the other way or making excuses for wrong behavior. Being gentle just means we don't overreact. And that's what we're professionals at, aren't we? We overreact. It doesn't mean we don't react at all. So we've got to learn as we're following Jesus and experiencing his forgiveness and mercy and grace and the gospel, how can we just share that with others? Same thing that Jesus has done for us, the same way he's dealt with us, how can we deal with others? See, foolish behavior and choices, they do need to be confronted, especially when someone could be making a potentially life-changing mistake. But we need to be like Jesus. Remember, it's always loving to talk about sin in a loving way. I love that. I read that this week. It's always loving to talk about sin in a loving way. Which leads us to number three. Love tells the truth even when the other person doesn't want to hear it. If I see you about to walk off the edge of a cliff, I've got, I've, I've got to warn you. It's my responsibility to, to tell you the truth, even if you don't want to hear it. But I want to remind us again, don't leave out the grace. We want to be full of truth and leave the grace behind. We need compassion and humility and empathy as we share 
the truth. Ray, as we were talking on Friday, he was like, this, this one's the hardest one. This one's the hardest. Because we're taking a risk, aren't we? When, we? when we share the truth in love with someone. This means sometimes our words might get misinterpreted. Someone might get upset with us. The, the person listening might not listen. He might not see from God's point of view that we're trying to share. They're not willing to hear it. But when moral issues are at stake, when I, when I see a, a, a repeated cycle of sin, of unrepentant sin in somebody's life, we've got to step in with the truth. Our obligation is to speak the truth in love. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6 says, An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. I've shared this before, but Jerry Campbell one time early in my marriage, uh, he loved me enough to speak truth into my life. He pulled me into his office one day. My wife had come and shared with him about some struggles we've been having and he said, Don, I love you like a son, but your wife is losing respect for you. You're losing her heart. And you need to do something. You need to do something different. You've got to address this. Now, that wasn't easy for him to say, but that was life-saving and marriage-saving for me and my wife. That was truth that I needed to hear from someone who loved me that I respected, that I was in relationship with. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than kisses from the enemy. I'm telling you today. So if somebody's trying to speak truth into your life, please let your defenses down. Would you listen? If, if they're coming humbly with the word of God, with truth from scripture, I'm begging you to listen. Because when truth and love combine in us, the result is an amazing impact in the kingdom for Christ. Truth is the content. Love is the motivation. Listen to Ephesians 4.15. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. See, that's, that's the reason why we speak the truth in love. So that we will all grow in every way more and more like Christ. That's the motivation. That's the motivation. So in closing, here's a couple of questions that I want us to consider. Am I willing to hear the truth even when I don't like it? Really? Think on that. Let the Spirit kind of speak truth to you right now. Or have you bought into the lie that love is unconditional approval and affirmation? Am I willing to hear the truth? Maybe someone's been trying to share some truth with you and you don't want to hear it. Will you let down your defenses and let God speak to you? Here's the next question. Do I need to speak the truth in love? Do I need to have an honest conversation with someone in my life? You're the only one that knows. And I want to ask you, what steps can you take this week in approaching that person? Humbly, lovingly, to share truth with them before they make a life-changing mistake, decision. Love is not unconditional affirmation. It's speaking and acting with the best interests of others in mind. Let me pray for us this morning.